house of the Lord. It's always good to be able to praise God. It's always good to thank God for all the things he has done for you. Now think about that just in the course of a week. <clears throat> uh, think of the month and the lifetime through the years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Think about all that God has done for you. One of the things that I um, have of an image, and I, I kind of shared it Sunday, <clears throat> I always get the image of God high and lifted up, just like Isaiah. And that's the way we should always view God, high and lifted up. <clears throat> One of the verses I really like, uh, found in Isaiah chapter 6, and it, and it starts off in one sense, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, in, in the bad, it starts out bad, but then it goes good. And sometimes that's how our lives are. <clears throat> in the year, and it's Isaiah chapter 6, Amplified, in the year that King Uzziah died, in a vision I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the skirts of his train filled the most holy part of the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two each covered his own face, with two each covered his feet, and with two each flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Yeah. How powerful is that to think about? You see, God high and lifted up. <clears throat> Folks, when we get that image of God, how can we ever doubt him or be worried about things? You know, when we realize God's high and lifted up, the whole earth is filled with his glory. Yeah, you're part of this earth. And you're something that God takes glory in. He loves you that much. <clears throat> and I was, I was driving to work. I, I love that time. I don't mind. You know, it takes about a half hour to get to work. But I, I listen to a Christian station, and they have songs on there. And this is one of my favorites. So I looked up the lyrics. And this is by Andre Crouch. And, and it was my tribute that he wrote to how he felt toward his God. I think it's so powerful. I just want to take a few minutes and share this because it just it just struck me today how can i say thanks for the things you have done for me things that god has done for me that is so powerful things so undeserved yet you gave to prove your love to me the voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude all that i am and ever hope to be i owe it all to thee that's what we have to come and realize it wasn't for God. I was thinking, <clears throat> sometimes you can think back in your life and you look at those points where it was the hardest and where nobody came. I mean, you, you, you got friends and God bless them. You got family, but sometimes you just need God there. Yeah. That's what you need. We think about the prodigal son <clears throat> that has spent all his money. The Bible said he came to himself. You come to the end and you realize, hey, I'll tell you what, this is getting pretty bad. When I'd rather, you know, I, I'm looking at thinking about, I'd rather be eating what the pigs are eating because that's the only turn I have. But then I think, hey, even the servants at home eat better than the pigs. They eat real good and they got more than enough to spare. And I'm thinking about sharing a meal with the hogs. We had pigs when I was little. That's what I call a slop, slop the hogs. Because that's what you did. They slop it, they eat anything. And think about you get down that low, get down that low, and you want to share a meal with them. But then he realized back home, wait a minute, it was better back home with my father. It was better back there. Tell you what, I'm going to go and tell my father I'm sorry. I don't even want to be a son. Just make me a hard servant. Just make me a servant. But how did he get treated when he came home? I love that. You talk about a picture of God restoring, you know, that the father saw that son and he ran to him. He ran to him. And the son, he's got this, oh, father, I'm sorry. It's like the father said, don't even say anything. Don't even say it. You're home now. You're home now. We're going to celebrate. You were dead, but now you're alive. You're blind. Now you see. Now you're home. That's all he was concerned about. Kill a fatted calf. Put a robe on. Put shoes on. Give him a ring. Give him a story back. That's what God does. That's right. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the things he has done. With his blood he has saved me. With his power he has raised me. Yes. To God be the glory for the things he has done. 
I love this next part. Just let me live my life and let it be pleasing, Lord, to thee. Well, how powerful is that? Oh, man. If I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Yes. How powerful is that? That's who deserves the glory. Yeah. <clears throat> I remember one time I worked with a guy. He, <clears throat> he was in loss prevention, and, I, and, and it just came to me today that, that and God brought it to my heart. He had to have a heart transplant, and he did at Mayo Clinic. And I remember seeing him before he <clears throat> he went, him and his wife come walking in there, and I tell I thought if she didn't hold him up, I thought he'd fall over. Mm -hmm. He had the oxygen and everything, he looked so bad. You know, and he could hardly talk, and you know, he was he was a thin guy anyway. <clears throat> and I remember, you know, he just he'd always try to smile. He he was our guard there when I go to the truck center out of Walmart. And then I saw him after he had his transplant. Never forget that. He became a greeter over at the store. And I remember walking into the store, and I heard that he had, had his transplant, was doing good. <clears throat> and I saw him, and I went in there and shook his hand and said, how you doing? And i never forget that. How you doing? You know what he did? His head went down like this, and he pointed his finger at the guy. Yeah. That's all he did. He didn't say it. He just went like this and pointed up. <laughs> and I knew I knew God had touched his life. That's what we call power. That's what, you know, you, when you see God do something in life, you want to always give him praise. When, when I, as I teach and somebody says, well, Tim, you got a lot of patience, you know, because, you know, we're out there in the truck. And like you say, you always take a driver's ed, think about it, a 40-ton vehicle. That's what I do for a living, you know. And we don't, we're, we're learning to drive. We haven't got there yet. We're learning to. You see, you got so much patience. Well, I remember when I didn't have patience. I remember that. And when somebody says, you know, I thank God for that. You know, I thank God because, you know, it's, it's great when you can see yourself stretched. When you can see yourself in that situation that happened years ago, you didn't react very good. But over here, hey, you said it roll off here. Because you've grown. God has touched you. And he deserves the glory. Yeah. He deserves to be high and lifted up. What has God done for you today? Think about it. all that he's done. Just take time one day and start writing out all the things God's done for you. I mean, you could feel, I mean, you know, the, the Bible talks about if everything that Jesus done, the whole world could contain the books. Right. All the stuff he has done for over and over and over. And yes, it's for people that some were unthankful. You know, I, I remember on Sunday morning, not when I wasn't where I should have been with God, sitting home reading Al Cap, you know, reading, <laughs> reading Little Abner. <laughs> Yeah. I wasn't reading the word of God, you know, but God had a plan. And then one day, life got turned around, and I don't read that. It's nothing wrong with reading Little Abner, if you like Little Abner. But, you know, Little Abner never did change my life. Yeah, that's right. Okay? Anna Green Gables never changed my life, let me tell you. They didn't do that. What changed my life was right here, the word of God. Yeah. When I can look in there and realize I'm loved with an everlasting love, that's what changed your life. What changed your life was realize that God forgives you. Mm -hmm. And one thing I love about God forgiving you is he don't bring it up over and over. Yeah. Some people, they can, I'm telling you, one thing I got to say, you know, I call my missus all the time, that is so great between us is one thing, we're always honest with each other. That's what a relationship is. Even, even when you don't feel comfortable with something, you know, we, we're, we're human beings. And like people say, we all have our picadillos. That's what one, per one person called. We all have those issues. But you know, when you talk it out, that's communicating. Right. You know, you're not going to, you know, God is so big. Sometimes we think, well, we shouldn't bring this to him. But I tell you, if we're unhappy about something, we need to just go to God and be honest. The, the best Christians I've ever seen are those who are just totally honest with God. You know, and cry, cry before him and don't understand. You know, you, you, you think about Samuel's mom, Hannah, when she was just, you know, out there and she just cried. And, and Eli thought she was drunk. She's up there talking, you know, talking, but the words, are, you know, her mouth's moving, but the words aren't coming out. No, Eli thought she was drunk. Uh -huh. No, she wasn't drunk. She was just pouring her heart out for the Lord. That's what she's going to, Lord, you know what? If, if you give me this son, I'll give it back to you. To King Samuel. God heard. God heard her call. You know.
know what? And that's where it comes, to really get down with God and say, God, you know what? I really want my life to change because I want my life to be pleasing to you no matter what the circumstance is. And that's where we really learn to love God is when we say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. You know, it may be uncomfortable, but I want to do it. And tonight, one thing we want to do as, as we open this up is realize what God has done for you and always look at him high and lifted up. Yeah. And for us, just like the seraphims did, for us, it should be the same way. Cry holy, holy, holy. Why? One person said, why do they say three holies? Holy Father, you know, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. I don't know if that's the case, but it'll work. So holy, holy, holy to the Lord. Because we got to think about holiness. You know, they used to say when I was growing up, it was holiness or hell. That's what it was. You're either going up or down. How do you want to live your life? And that's where it comes to. And when you surrender to God, that's where your life changed. When you totally give it all to God and say, God, whatever you want to do with my life. Yeah. Why? Because, as I said many times, but it's true, if he died for us, sure, we should live for him. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're going to open this up. I uh, would appreciate prayers Uh we're going to be doing some trucking this coming weekend, so always appreciate prayers for that out on the road. Yeah. Um, uh, we do things with the band and, and pull a trailer, and, and sometimes there's a lot of people around, around that. You know, when you get 10,000 people and you're 70 foot long, it don't always fit very good. So yeah. always, uh, I really do appreciate prayers for that. And we're going to pray for the shootings they had today, you know, yeah. and the shootings about in our country. You know, the, the one thing I found out when all those circumstances, whether it's somebody that's six years old or 50 years old, that it, it pays really to have your life right with God. Mm -hmm. You know, it really does because you never know. Right. You know, <clears throat> when we leave home, we always assume we're coming back. I mean, generally, that's, that's what you're going to do. You make plans, but you do not know anymore. Mm -hmm. So one thing you always want to do is tell that loved one, I love them that day. Always. Always. You know, you never want to end. That's one thing you learn is never want to end with an argument. You don't ever go to sleep with an argument and have that the last memory. You always want to let them know you love them. My mom always used to say, Tim, give me flowers while I live. She'd always say that. Give me flowers now. She can't see them on the other side. Give me flowers now, right? Yeah. And that's what we want to do. We want to show people, you know what? We love you and God loves you. Yeah. So as we go open this time up, Anybody would like to praise the Lord? Come on, come on. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes, brother. <clears throat> That's right. That's right. Hallelujah. Yeah, praise the Lord. That's it. God wants to show himself mighty. He does. That the ones that really love him, to, to see God move in your life where you thought the thing above, he always does. Above what you can even ask or even think of. That's right. You know? And I, I remember one time I, I, I needed to get a vehicle that broke down. And, and, and honestly, one of my favorite colors is not green. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's just not my fit. Some people like green, and that's fine. <clears throat> so I went over to the car dealer, and I said, Lord, I was praying. I said, Lord, I said, I, I want to make sure we can do everything in one day. You know, get the financing. You know, trade and get out. Everything worked out. So I came over there and talked to the lady. I bought a couple of cars through her. And she said, I got one for you. I called ahead and I got one for you. And and, uh, and uh, so the salesman, she sold me, sold me, took me out. And guess what color it was? Green. It was green. And I thought, man, you know. And, and then the Lord spoke to my heart. Tim, you know what? You didn't ask me for a specific color. Oh. 
You asked him for a vehicle. That's what you asked him for, right? You didn't say blue or whatever. You just asked for a vehicle. So what happened was I drove it, really liked it. My son was with me. And by the time we got all the financing done, they, they brought it in this showroom they had in the back. And they had all the, they had cleaned it up and it had the lights shining off of it. Because I was looking for my son. He was sitting in the driver's seat, ready to go. And it was absolutely so beautiful. It was so beautiful. And I thought, God, I, I, you know what I'm going to not do from here on out? I'm not going to be complaining. And from that car and the cars on, you know what we do? We pray over those cars. Yeah. Yeah. We pray over. And when God said it's time to let it go, we let it go. And he blessed us with another one. Amen. But I learned you hurt your own life when you complain. Mm -hmm. I, I've just seen it. It's like you almost limit God. He wants to bless you so much. You know, just think about the children of Israel. You know, when they when they crossed the dry land, you know, they, the Red Sea was the part. Wouldn't it have been terrible? I don't know if I can really trust God and cross here. Here's the gypsies. They're coming. They're on the way. And and, and and was parted. You know, someone probably reached out and touched the water along the way. But they went across on dry land. The Bible says dry land. You know, I mean, it wasn't muddy. You know, and the, and the cow, everything, every, all, all the animals, the carts, everybody made a cross. Not one was left. Right. Now think about that, you know? And you're gonna, and then it wasn't too many days after that. It's almost like they forgot that God parted the sea. They forgot, and they're cutting plain because they don't have water. You know, they went to the place of bitterness and they're, they're complaining. Well, look, wait a minute, we're missing something here. We're missing something. God just opened the Red Sea for you. You walked on dry land. That same God that was on that side of the river is the same God on that side of the river. That's really what we have to remember. And somehow we forget that. God delivers us from here. What makes us think he's not going to deliver us over here? Amen. But we seem to forget in between because that happened long ago. No, let's never forget because in the Old Testament, they used to put markers. They build these altars. To where God did a mighty work for them. So they never forget that. Amen. They never forget. Someone else. Thank you, Lord. Someone else. Yes, Mike. Just keep lifting Cindy up. She's, she's doing better. Uh, just want to get her back here in the fellowship. She misses all you guys and stuff. And I know she's online watching right now. She's making sure I don't goof up on some oh. camera and stuff here. <laughs> uh, anyway, just keep her lifted up. And, uh, and uh, for Tammy, she's not feeling well. Jody and Toby that they're coming back from their uh, vacation and for Suzanne and Michael have been getting their house prepped to get sold for Roberto as he's going through his wedding preparations. Um, yeah, just watch over them and for uh, James who's AWOL and, uh, and uh, <coughs> watch over him. Just watch over him. Yeah. Rick and Nancy and their family, the things that they've been facing. Um, and Bonnie who visited last Sunday she was part of the choir and stuff. I used to do worship ministry and stuff up there and stuff. And she hasn't been able to do music uh, for quite some time now because uh, the, the level of sound and the music and stuff just gives her migraines and stuff. And I know that's not of the Lord. Right. So we just rebuke those migraines and pray for healing right now in the name of Jesus so she can continue in the worship ministry that, that I worked alongside with her with. And as the Lord leads her here, she, the Lord led her here. Uh, Sunday, and uh, she wrote me in a note, um, I'll paraphrase what she said, uh, she's already been to another church in Des Moines, uh, early Sunday morning, but she came here because she needed to be loved on, and uh, you guys fit the bill, this church gets loved on her, and uh, she appreciated it, so just keep her lifted up, pray healing on the migraines. We definitely do that, That that's what the church is for, yeah. pray for one another, that's exactly what we're here for. You know, to love each other, support each other. Yep. You know, and, and old truck drivers tell me we lock arms. That's how we do it. We lock arms. Yep. You know, and so. Okay, is there anybody else? Amen. Okay, would you all stand, please? We're going to go to prayer. <coughs> oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. <coughs> Thank you, Lord, for leading us to this house of worship tonight so we can worship you because Lord we're going to lift you up your word said if you be lifted up you draw all men unto you 
Lord, let us be lifted up. And when our prayers be lifted up to you, that they go far above this ceiling and go straight to your throne. Let them prayers go up. Hallelujah. Like John the Baptist said, I want to decrease so you can increase. Lord, we want you to get bigger and bigger in our hearts and our lives. The song said, I surrender all. Let that be the case, Lord. Father God, I ask you to be with Cindy. It's doing better. Keep working in her life. And Jody and Toby and Tammy and all those, Roberto, and that's getting the plans done, James and Rick and Nancy and Bonnie and, 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 and all of them, Lord. All the church members. That you be with each and every one of the householders represented here tonight. That you would touch them. Lord, if they have a need of healing, touch their lives. If they had a need of deliverance, deliver them tonight, Lord. If they need a financial blessing, let them be blessed tonight. Because one thing about it, it's all about you, Lord. It's all about you. Let us never forget what you have done for us. Without you, where would we be? If there be any, any praise, let it always go to you. Father God, tonight, let our hearts forever be changed before we leave this house. Let us realize that you have brought us a mighty long way and you have plans to take us to farther and farther out because it's time to enlarge our tents and realize that God you are the wonderful Father. You are the wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Lord. Father God, you are Emmanuel. God with us. Let us never forget that you love us with an everlasting love. Let us always have an honest and open relationship before you. The Bible said you seek as such to worship in spirit and in truth. Let us never forget that. Thank you for forgiving us for our sins and casting them into the sea of forgetfulness and never bringing them back up again. You have made us a new creation in you. As Paul said, oh, to know him. And that's our chief desire, to know you, God. To know and remember all that you have done. That word remember keeps coming up. Remember. Remember that creator. Hallelujah. In your youth, remember him. Remember where you used to be, but we're not there anymore. Remember where you brought us from. Oh, Father God, we got so much to thank you for. Let us never forget. And Lord, as we go deeper into the service, let your Holy Spirit have the right of way tonight. You would be lifted up. And we thank you in your wonderful holy name. Amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. All right. Eastern Gate Prayer. October 14th is the correct date. October 14th. East Gatehouse of Prayer. If you can join us. Amen. Let's speak the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ, every tissue of this body function to the perfection to which God created to function. 
and I forbid any malfunction in his body in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. Hallelujah. The Lord rebukes the vow for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. Brother Eric, would you come please and take the offering for us tonight? Thank you.
Praise the Lord. Jesus, we just love you tonight. We thank you for first loving us, placing your love in us by the power of your spirit. Lord, help us to remain sensitive to your spirit, to allow your love to flow, that you might be made manifest to this world. For you are love. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for being you, Lord. We celebrate you tonight. We praise you. We worship you, Lord. You alone are worthy. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless all of you. you. May be seated. Thank you, Tim, for opening. Thanks, Mike, and the worship team. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I can't. Can't help myself. Praise the Lord. God bless everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. God's good. Amen. So I'll give Mike a chance to get up there, and then we'll get right into the Word of God tonight. I want to begin uh, in the book of Judges, chapter 6, and uh, we'll read verses uh, 11, 11 through 16. Judges 11, or excuse me, Judges 6, verses 11 through 16. This felt like fall today, didn't it? We're by the pumpkin patch over by Ankeny, and there's pumpkins out there. I don't know where they got them, but they've got them. They're all over the place. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an Oprah that pertained unto Joash the Abarazite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Praise the Lord. All right, Acts chapter 18 and uh, verses 9 and 10. And leading up to this uh, two scriptures, Paul has uh, run into a bunch of resistance, and uh, in, in one place he's on Mars Hill, and he's talking to these uh, to the Greeks there and talking to them and and it goes pretty good until he starts talking about the resurrection and then it says they started to mock him and and ridiculed him so forth then the next one the next chapter uh, he he is kind of going through the same thing all over again and a few people are believing but most of the Jews who is who he was uh, presenting his message to they rejected him in fact they were angry with him and got hostile and everything else and so he says I'm done I'm through with you. I'm turning to the Gentiles from this place, from this point on. And then immediately the Lord speaks to him. And then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Now, that encourages me that, uh, you know, we kind of expect it from Gideon because we've read that story often enough. But we had a tendency to think that, you know, Paul was above all this. But the truth is, Paul had his issues in terms of, uh, you know, if God was blessing the particular thing he was doing at that given time. Otherwise, God wouldn't have had to come to him in a dream and speak to him about that very thing. He's telling him, look, it may not look like everything's happening the way it's supposed to happen, but trust me, I'm with you. And I'm going to see to it that you're going to get the job done. Amen. So, you know, uh, when I look at these guys, I think, you know, this is, this is college football season. Uh, any of you missed that, I uh, thought I'd bring you up to date. But, you know, everybody loves an underdog. 
I do. I know I do anyway. But nobody wants to be one. You know, I, I love these games. I, I, I watch a lot of football. I don't watch every game, but I do watch quite a bit of it. Uh, my wife will tell you way more than I need, or way more than she needs anyway. To, fortunately, we have more than one television, so she's not forced to watch it all. But I do like, I, I love it when an underdog wins, as long as it isn't winning over my team, which is what happened here just a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and it happens, you know, but you can't help but just kind of get behind the underdog and, and want to see him succeed and, and be successful, you know. So the truth is generally, you know, we as human beings, we want to be on top. You know, we want to win, uh, we want to achieve, and we want to have as, m as few minimal setbacks as absolutely possible. You know, we just want things to flow. Everything should just go good and we just get out there and, and we win. But the reality is failure happens. And uh, not many of us have gone this far in life looking at the people that are sitting here tonight with the exception of one young man who's probably just going to be successful all the time and never fail. That's my prayer, praise the Lord. But it does happen, and you live uh, any length of time, and you realize that. You just can't go far in life without being the underdog at least a few times. If a Cinderella, and I love that, you know, Cinderella was the underdog, obviously. She was the stepsister that had nothing, and, you know, it was, but that's why they call them Cinderella teams, you know. So what, I, you know, I get excited when I, a Cinderella team emerges in sports, and nearly everybody starts rooting for them, as long as they're not playing their team, right? I mean, everybody just loves, this country especially, I don't know what it is, but we just love the underdog. We love to see somebody come from nothing and just win it all, you know, and just be successful. So it's our nature to love them. And the Bible's filled with them. I mean, that's the story of the Bible. Amen? And I've got a theory about why we love underdogs. It's because God loves underdogs. Come on. Amen? And so <laughs> Noah was a laughing stock. You know, he, he, he was building something that nobody could figure out. And he was building it to save his family before something no one had ever seen could destroy him. Right. Abraham and Sarah. In a culture where family and, and, and uh, large families were the thing, they were well into their 80s with no family, no children. Against all of the odds, God gave him a son and he made Abraham the father of many nations, right? Yep. Jacob was a deceiver. In fact, his name actually means crooked. Yep. He was a crook. And we know he was because he lied and finagled and, and deceived his brother and got the birthright. Mm -hmm. And yet, God trusted him and made him the father of the 12 patriarchs that would become the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. Moses, a murderer, kills an Egyptian, ran away. Couldn't face the music. Run off into Midian and out into the desert. But God restored him, called him his friend, and used him to lead Israel from slavery. Mm -hmm. Rahab, a prostitute, protected two spies on a mission from God. And later, Rahab was saved and spared by, by the same spies or by the, the, those that had sent out the spies, the Israelites, and became an ancestor of Jesus, a great, 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 great something grandmother to Jesus himself. David, the runt of the litter, too young for military uh, service, mocked by his own family, by his own brothers, and in fact, kind of disrespected by his own dad when, when Samuel came to, to uh, anoint the... Uh, the king, who would be the next king, they didn't even bother to call him in. They just figured that's the kid, that's the run of the litter. He's out there with the sheep. He can stay there. We don't even need him. But God used him to kill Goliath, the enemy, not just of Israel, but the enemy of God. Over and over in his life, God used him with all of his failures, and God still used him. Paul. <laughs> Spoke of just briefly here. Paul was a murderer. 
persecutor of the church, a persecutor of Christ. And God uses him to be a witness to the Gentiles and to go on to write two-thirds of the New Testament. Then there's Jesus, who in the natural had the most humble beginnings, had nothing that we could associate with power or influence. In fact, it says birds have their nests, foxes have their lairs, or their, and the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He was constantly opposed by the very people that he came to save. And yet, he's become the most influential person in history. By the world's standards, all of these people started as underdogs, started as failures. So cheer up. <laughs> so, that's right. You find yourself in the role of an underdog, and if you haven't, you will. Or you feel like you failed or come short. You can't avoid failure 100% of the time. And in fact, it's actually pointless to try. And that's not bad because God only uses failures. He only uses underdogs. Praise God. I'm not saying you should try to fail. You don't have to try. Believe me, it's, it's not something you have to work at. Failure hurts, but you can't let it get you down. Failure puts you in a place where God can use you. That's not a message everybody wants to hear, but it is a fact. It's a reality. Let's look at a, a few scriptures here. Romans chapter 5 and verse 18. The difference between a failure and someone who fails is that a failure quits when they fail. I mentioned Sunday... You know, uh, we can get kind of morose sometimes when I say we. I'm actually talking about me. I'm using the, uh, you know, the royal uh, <laughs> speech. Or, you know, I'm saying I get sometimes. You know, you get frustrated. You get aggravated. You get whatever. I don't know. And, uh, you know, I, I have a tendency to say what I feel sometimes, even if it's not necessarily the best thing to say. But I think it's. I think it's more important sometimes that we say, say the truth than it is to try to put on a facade to make everybody think, well, his life is perfect. You know, I mean, how, I don't get it. You know, why is it so good for him? You know, he's special or what? No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm an underdog, amen? And I have done my share of failing. But what I did have learned, and I mentioned it Sunday, and I think my wife will verify this after 37 years of uh, marriage, that like the chicken and the hog, you know, the, they're, they're, they're both interested in breakfast, ham and eggs. The chicken is actually interested. The hog is committed. And the difference between, the difference between being an underdog and being a success is being willing to just be interested and not committed. To anything. I don't care what it is. I'm not just talking about church. I'm talking about life, period. If you're not going to commit, you can be interested. You can, you know, talk about it, act like you're, you care about it. But commitment is the thing that changes everything. Right. Whatever it is, a marriage, any relationship, a job, a career, a business, everything takes commitment if you're going to succeed. Mm -hmm. And most importantly with the Lord. A lot of people are interested in religion. A lot of people are interested even in Jesus. But what Jesus is looking for is commitment. And I don't mean this in a religious way of beating people up because, you know, we, we, we deviate from time to time in terms of our, our focus. But I'm talking about a commitment that just, even when I fail, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do it again. Amen? Even, even when I'm the underdog, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit just because everything isn't flowing exactly the way I want it to. Amen? That's what God's looking for. That's what God is looking for in us. Yeah. Commitment. Commitment to Him. 
not to religion, not to rules and regulations, but a commitment to him. So that people can see the reality of this. So therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification. Everybody's a loser without Jesus. Mm -hmm. Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I'll send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. This is Moses. The guy that was a murderer, the guy that was a failure, the guy that was running from what he thought was his call, and then he runs away. And God shows up. He said, come on, I got a job for you. Don't give up. You're still going you're, you're gonna to win the battle. You're going to end up being successful because I'm going to be with you. I'm going with you. Luke chapter 1, well, let's just, let's just move on to Romans. Romans 7, 24 and 25 for the sake of time. Romans 7, 24 and 25. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This is Paul. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Well, that's not real encouraging coming from Paul, but it's the truth. And every person that God uses has a history of failure. Paul's talking about his own physical failures when it comes to, 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 to being everything that he wants to be for God. So instead of being discouraged when you fall short, look at your failures as opportunities. Opportunities for God to step in and do something that you're not able to do. Instead of living your life in fear of failure, have confidence that God will raise up the failures and make you successes. He'll take the underdog and make you the winner. Amen? Romans 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, if you believe the word of God, you've got to believe that even failure can be a positive. Even being the underdog can be a very positive thing because God will take that failure and make something positive out of it, make a success out of it. Amen? He'll take that underdog that everybody's already turned their back on and decided they're done, they're, they're, they're finished, and raise them up to a place where everyone can see the glory of God manifested. So God's in the business of transforming people that he loves into people who become more and more like Jesus. Amen. He uses our failures for that very purpose. I was talking about it tonight. When you come to the end of yourself, what do you find? Not much without God, right? So he's in the business of using our failures to actually transform us into something creative, something glorious, something that will, will declare the reality of God in a world where people are turning their back on him. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So whoever it is, whenever uh, we talk about these things, as I did a little bit Sunday and, and just briefly touched on here uh, about me personally, it's, it's the idea that when we admit that we're not all that in a bag of chips, that God is able to move in and do something with our lives. Amen. It's those, you know, that are so sure that we've got it all together, have it all figured out, and never, never fail, never, you know, never get down, never, never question, never doubt, that God has trouble doing much with. Amen. The more honest we are with one another and the more honest we are with God, it might as well be he knows anyhow, the more God is able to do things in our lives and through our lives. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, verse 47. We'll just touch on a few of these. I'm about done here, but I just want to use a few scriptures here.
All this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he'll give you into our hands. Basically the same thing God told Gideon. All I'm asking you to do is trust me. I'll take care of the battle. Isn't that what he always does? Isn't that what he did with Moses and the children of Israel? Amen. Tim was talking about it tonight. Just all I'm asking you to do is just start walking. Just trust me to get you to where I, where I have promised to take you. Praise the Lord. All right, Gideon in Judges chapter 7. Uh, you don't have to go there, Mike, but I'll just briefly. By verse 7, they started out with like 10,000 people. God has called him first, Gideon gives the excuse, hey, I'm nobody, I'm from a family of nobodies, uh, we don't have anything, we've never been anything, and uh, now you're telling me I'm this mighty man of valor? Where did you get that from? And God tells him, look, I'm going to go with you. And to prove that to you, Gideon comes with 10,000 men thinking, well, that's quite a few, maybe we can whip the Midianites. And God said, that's too many. And he just starts narrowing it down until they get to 300. Now, by this time, I think Gideon probably has just had, he's stroked out. I mean, he's thinking, nothing can happen here, but we're going to die and die quickly. And God said, I'm going to go with you. The battle is not yours. I'm just asking you to go, to trust me. And what happens, you know the story, the pitchers are broken, the trumpets are blasted, and the enemy kills each other. Right. Elijah, in 1 Kings chapter 18. Elijah's ready to give up, too. Everybody's after him. They're all trying to get him. And God says, go to the cave. He goes to the cave. He's in there, and he's, he's got the mantle wrapped around his face, and he's basically hiding from, the, from uh, Jezebel and, uh, and, and from God. And God says, come out to the cave. Come out to the door here. He sees the lightning flash. He sees the thunder. He sees all the things that look like the power of God. And then he hears this still, small voice. Huh? He says, why are you here? Why are you here in the cave when I've called you to something greater than this? Psalms 46, verse 1. David, who had been, uh, had every reason to have an inferiority complex, I suspect, because of the way he was raised, because of his family, because of all that. But God raises up this kid who otherwise would have had a complex, probably, uh, based on what we what we know about his childhood, and God raises him up, and here's what David has to say about him. He's our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. David learned some things about God because of his failures, because of him being the underdog. He learned to trust God. He learned to put his confidence in the Lord, and God never failed him. God never let him down. Amen? Amen. Philippians 4. Verses 12 and 13. This is Paul that we've already read about. He struggled with his own issues. He struggled with the call that God had on his life, if he could even perform it. Here's what he says in, in Philippians 4, 12 through 13. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Praise the Lord. And last scripture, Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. <clears throat> Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So I'm going to close with this. I'm just, I'll just say it like this. When you start to become the focus, it's time to step back and refocus. Anytime we get down, anytime we're depressed, anytime we're defeated, it's because we're focusing on us and not on God. That's not a revelation to any of you, I know, but it, it bears repeating every once in a while because I've been around this for a long time, and I can still get focused on me. I can still feel sorry for myself, even though it's not the kind of thing I normally do, or at least I don't normally talk about it. But I do have those feelings like everybody else does. And it happens whenever the focus starts to become more about me and my definition 
of what God's wanting and what, what I call success instead of focusing on him. Amen. Because as long as I'm focusing on him, it's not hard. It's easy. You just rest in him and quit worrying about your role and focus on his role. Amen. So let God do the heavy lifting. Let him worry about the success. Amen. Let him protect us. Let him be strong for us so we don't have to. Amen. Say praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. Then give him a hand clap for that. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. God bless you. So all, all I got to say tonight is this. Stay focused on the Lord. Whatever you're going through, whatever you may go through, he's got the answer. He'll fight the battle, and he will win the battle. Amen. Leave the battling in his hands. Just amen. trust him. Amen. amen. God bless all of you. Love you. Appreciate you being here tonight. Have a safe trip home. Hope to see you back here Sunday. God bless you.